Welcome to this week's edition of Insights. Uh, during this week's show, we're going to be discussing the failures of Armenian diplomacy, specifically focused in the first uh, first year uh, after the end of Aliyev and Erdogan's war of aggression against Artsakh and Armenia. Uh, this show is not going to speak of individuals. We're going to talk about the uh, the collective failures of uh, essentially our diplomatic services because what matters, as we know, are not individuals in the big scheme of things, but systems. Uh, the show itself will be an exercise in asking questions and uh, giving commentary as we go along. My first question for our diplomatic services is, or actually for our government, is what is our policy in regards to Artsakh? Do you have a concrete policy? Because if you do, you have not explained it in any understandable way. What should be our policy in Artsakh is frankly to present the world with three options, which are the three likely outcomes of what the future holds. The first one we will call the Erdogan Aliyev option, which is ethnic cleansing or genocide of our Armenians living in Artsakh. This has been their goal all along. In fact, it is the reason that negotiations have failed for the past 30 years. And it's the reason that they will do everything to stop from any OSC negotiation process to begin again, because they are not interested in a negotiated settlement that is fair to all parties. What they are interested in is complete victory, which for them is an Artsakh entirely free of its historic Armenian population that have lived there for millennia. That is option number one that needs to be presented to the world. Are you for this or are you against it? The second option is to freeze the current situation and freeze it into law, not into some five-year mandate, but essentially either through UN Security Council resolutions or a forced negotiated settlement something that codifies the presence of peacekeepers protecting Artsakh from the plan of ethnic cleansing and genocide and restarting the OSCE negotiating process. That should be our primary goal and task over the next couple of years. Now, if the second option is not possible, then the only immediate possible solution is what we know, which is remedial secession. In international law, if a country is intent on wiping out, committing genocide, or trying planning an ethnic cleansing of a minority population, they actually lose the legal right to rule those people. The Yalayev regime long ago lost any moral or legal right to have any say over the lives of the Armenians of Artsakh. In fact, if you look at the Kosovo president, uh, what the Aliyev regime has done, has threatened to do, and is doing on a daily basis, is far more severe and far more racist than anything Slodovon Milosevic's regime ever did in Kosovo. So if option two is not a possibility, then option three, is with the world's choice. Our job, the job of our diplomats, is to simplify the options to the three things that we outlined. They need to be pushed into a corner and made to decide, are you for genocide and ethnic cleansing? And if you're not, and if you're not, these are the two options. There are no other options. Our job is to simplify and clarify this issue and to leave the least amount of wiggle room to the international community. My second question for our government and our diplomatic services is, have you done any internal studies uh, to understand the failures of Armenian diplomacy over the past few decades? And if you have not, why not? Because in order to reform, in order to improve and do your job better, you have to clearly understand the basis of your failure. My third question is, how in God's name are you losing a public relations war with this degenerate racist and his neo-fascist regime? Let me be brutally clear. You're losing a PR war to a guy who both in his physical manifestation of his ugliness and his rhetoric 
is a oriental despot out of central casting, quite easy to demonize. You're losing the PR war to a country, a state, whose official national hero is an axe murderer. You're losing the PR war to a country, a joke of a country, whose vice president happens to be its first lady. You're losing a PR war to a leader who has destroyed more historical sites than ISIS and the Taliban combined. You're losing the PR war to a leader that has, international, that has trafficked international terrorists related to Al-Qaeda into Artsakh to commit war crimes. You're losing a PR war to a leader that used his personal plane to kidnap Jews and torture them as they did in the case of Alexander Lapshin, and in fact he was convicted for doing so. You're losing the PR war that is holding illegally hundreds of Armenian POWs and civilians in its dungeons. You're losing the PR war to a leader who along with his terrorist and Turkish allies committed the worst war crimes on European soil since the Bosnian War in the early 90s. In reality, you're losing this PR war because frankly, we're not engaging in it in any meaningful way. Half of life is just showing up and our side simply has not shown up in the public relations battle over the last year in defining what happened last year in the war of aggression against the people of Artsakh. Then my other question for you is, what is our story? What narrative are you telling people? What is Armenia's story in the, in the world and specifically in regards to Artsakh? And I'll simplify this for you. If you are an Armenian diplomat and on a daily basis you're not telling one of your diplomatic colleagues from other countries or someone from the international press that Armenia is an island of freedom in a sea of tyranny, you're failing on your job. In fact, you should quit and come home. If you're not framing the Artsakh issue on a daily basis based on the principles of human rights, then you're failing on the job. Uh, why is this important? Because the Artsakh issue in reality has been reduced to human rights. It is no longer about territorial integrity. It is no longer about occupied or liberated territories. It is about what does a fascist regime get to do to a subject minority population. The entire conversation needs to be reduced to that and the world needs to be put into a corner to make a choice. That is your job on a daily basis. My fourth question for you is, what is the story you're telling us, telling the world about our enemies? So much of public relations in the world today is really about negative identity, where you sort of identify yourself by what you're not and what you're up against. Again, I will simplify this for you. Uh, if you're an Armenian diplomat and on a daily basis you're not telling members of the press or your diplomatic colleagues in explaining last year's war that last year's war was actually Armenia and Artsakh being attacked by the oldest unreformed fascist state in, the, in Europe, which is Turkey, and by the newest racialized neo-fascist state in Europe, Azerbaijan, as the world stood by and did nothing. That should be our story night and day in explaining last year's war. Let's take this forward. If in defining our enemies, if two years from now, whenever the Western press is giving its usual litany of bad guy dictators, if Ilhan Aliyev's name is not constantly running with Saddam's, Gaddafi's, Kim Jong-un's and others of the type, you're failing on your job because he is as bad as them, if not worse. And it's your job to make that case. The next question is, what are you doing to impose our framing language and narrative on the world. The truth is the modern world is a world of public relations and whoever frames the issue and the arguments will be the side that will win the issue and the political outcomes that come with that. My next question is what is your American policy or do you even have one? Uh, 
the United States constantly taking neutral positions on issues relating to Artsakh and Armenia are simply unacceptable. There are millions of Armenian Americans that live in the United States and are involved in every influential part of that society. The fact that we have not been able to engage them in a far more substantive way is a huge failure. Now why is the United States important? It is true that the United States is becoming less interested in the Middle East or the greater, this greater region. That is certainly the case. And the United States, frankly, is involved in, in some long internal political dysfunctions. That's also clear. But the truth of the matter is the United States is still the number one power in the world. And if we're going to have any shot at restarting serious third-party negotiations via the OSCE, it was only going to come about via American pressure. The Europeans, for the most part, uh, either don't have the political weight or the willingness to do that. So we need a serious American policy. Let's move on to my other question. Next year uh, are the French presidential elections. What is your plan to weaponize those elections into something that is useful to Armenia and Artsakh? Uh, why this is important is during next year's elections, which is likely going to be a runoff between the current president Macron and probably Eric Zamor, uh, both parties are going to need Armenian, French Armenian voters that are somewhat swing constituencies in France. Uh, these are people that both sides are going to need to reach. So what is your plan to make specific concessions or specific promises from them during the campaign in regards to what our diplomatic goals are? France, at the end of the day, is the most pro-Armenian country in the EU, for whatever that's worth, and the second most relevant power within that union. So we must have a consistent French policy, elections or not, but next year actually offers us a very unique opportunity. My other question is, what are you doing to upgrade your communication systems? both internationally and locally, in telling our story. And this directly links to another topic, which is, as we know, there are many ministries in Armenia, for example, economy and health, that have actually been bringing in diaspora experts and making them deputy ministers and giving them high positions. So this is not, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We have hundreds of Armenians around the world involved in public relations, diplomacy and politics, that need to be engaged and some of whom can be brought here to take positions that can quickly upgrade our diplomatic services. I will give you an example and what can be done at an ambassadorial level. Uh, as we know, uh, ambassadors generally don't make policy. They're there to make relationships. There are plenty of former um, Armenian, Armenian executives from around the world, diaspora Armenians, that can be brought in. Someone did a lot of business in the Gulf you can make them an ambassador to the UAE and their focus will be to create relationships politically and in business. We do not need to limit ourselves to what we have now. We can actually quickly upgrade our systems by being open-minded and engaging more people. In conclusion, it brings me absolutely no joy to speak in these terms because I know for a fact that there are many really outstanding people in our diplomatic services. Unfortunately, those outstanding people come nowhere close to being the majority. Uh, and these, the times we're living in, are no times for soft language or pretty words. They're about the harshest truths and how, what steps we can take to deal with them. We can do much better on this front if we're willing to engage a greater number of people. We have the ability to, in the, in the short run, quickly upgrade our diplomatic and public relations abilities if we're willing to be open-minded and engage a lot more people in forward-looking, dynamic ways. Thank you for joining us in this week's edition of Insights.